This is my second Black Author Spotlight. And this is, I said this last night, this is something that I just like came up with because I have several friends that I consider family who have recently um, written and published their own books. And it's not just like random books, but great knowledge and like a wealth of information. And I really wanted to share with other people. I also wanted to support Black authors um by buying their books sharing them with others and just letting people know how great they are and so tonight i'm actually going to have uh someone by the name of Mbwebe ishangi and he also wrote a phenomenal book that we're going to talk about tonight and dive into some really good information and he'll tell you all about himself so as soon as i see if he is on here and i can add him we will get right into it Bro. Hey. Hey. Good? How's it going? How you doing? All right. All right. I'm that's good. so grateful for you giving us time to be here tonight and like just give yourself to the people tonight. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> get it together. <laughs> try to get try to get the you know coordination right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate the appreciate the opportunity for real. No doubt. Family. 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 Right. Look, I'm that's about to right. get, I'm about to get into that real quick. Um, got so you, got without you. further ado, I want us to jump right in because I definitely want to honor and respect your time. So uh, I met in Webe in Kemet or Egypt, um, as some people would call it. And we just we became family there. There were probably about more than 15 of us that were there with Tony Browder for the cultural tour in 2016. And we went as strangers and left this family. And so I consider Mbwebe family, my brother. And tonight, I just wanted to have him on to share one of the five books that he's written. <laughs> yes, I had to plug that in. He's written Good five, times. and this is just the one, the most recent one that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, Mbwebe is also like one of the first people that I've heard speak about Bitcoin and not just speak about it, but also uh, strategically teach black people how to get involved in cryptocurrency because it's so much it's so much bigger than just Bitcoin. And so he teaches people, black people, communities about cryptocurrency. And it's just been really a pleasure knowing him and being able to attain this knowledge. So I'm going to read a small part from the back of your book in Webe. I think this is important for people to hear. And so it says, Mwebe Ishangi's world changed in 2017 after working 12 years for the National Basketball Association. Yes, the NBA. Um, he was abruptly let go, not because of his work ethic, but his cultural views. This began his journey in realizing you can never be financially stable if you rely on someone or rely on someone else to pay you for if you allow them to feed you, they can also starve you. That's a word. That is a whole mm -hmm. word. An author of five books, his latest shows how you can live off your savings and investments and live a life of your choosing minus money worries. So without further ado, Mbwebe, take it away. Let the people know who you are. <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank you, um, sis, for providing me this opportunity to network and and speak with your circle. Um, it's so important that we utilize these platforms to not just, you know, talk about gossip, but, you know, do some community building, some mental enlightenment, and yeah. preferably some financial enlightenment. Um, so just to, just to give a backdrop, um, for Brooklyn, New York, um, I've been, uh, by, by, by nature or by, I'd say my, my practice, I've been a student for life uh, when it comes to study of Nile Valley civilization. Uh, African history. Uh, I've been a writer. I've been putting out a magazine for 27 years called The Ghetto Times yeah. Magazine, where I basically talk about um, uh, diasporic information that is, uh, you know, oftentimes not taught, taught in our schools nor in our homes. So I talk about areas from, from history to health, 
Uh, even I'll throw in conspiracies. We'll talk about the origin of holidays and look at it from an African perspective. As I look to stand on the shoulders of our um, our historians, our, our Dr. Uh, John Henry Clarks, you know, our recently passed Nana Sekhmet, um, Pat Patricia Newton. These are giants that have done the research to help us find ourselves and reclaim ourselves. But it's up to the next generation to do our part so that the generations after us can continue on this uh, remembering of our history, as Anthony Browder would say, as my Jedna. Um, so, but how does that, what does that have to do with financial literacy, right? Because, uh, you know, as, as, as stated in the back of the cover of my book is that um, I worked for an MBA for 12 years and, you know, it was a thankless job. Um, Thank you. Thanks for the plug plug. I got you. It was a, you uh, <laughs> I, I, I have my reserve. Bang, bang. Oh, okay. Well, um, look, look. <laughs> well, okay. There you go. No, let me show you the book. No, I, <laughs> the, the stack I got. No, I shouldn't have. Let's be getting rid of them. But anyway, uh, but no, just the, the reality of losing your job, not because of your work ethic. Uh, I lost my job because of what I post on my social media pages, which again, is the information pertaining towards African people. And obviously that doesn't fit their brand. And they uh, basically, you know, fire me on the spot and without notice. And at that point, I always ask my clients now, you know, what is the first thing you think about when you show up to work on a Monday or you're checking out on a Friday and they suddenly tell you they're letting you go? The first thing you're going to think about is going to be your finances. Right. And so I was in that situation and we've all been at some point or another been in that position where we're thinking immediately about my money and how can I pay my bills or how can I eat, you know, uh, because I don't want to lose what I've ha what I have, and so with that happening, um, that began my journey to figuring out that it was more than at the time I was getting into cryptocurrency, uh, and that has its place. Uh, but for me, there's something. Uh, cryptocurrency is more of a futures type of investment. Uh, we need money now. We need money every 30 days. Yep. We need to be able to pay our bills. We need to be able to sustain ourselves and our families. So you know, for me, cryptocurrency wasn't. And isn't at that point right now, even though I started out my company called Crypto Woke, yep. it evolved into, into the Crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Movement. And ironically enough, when you look at the etymology of the word crypto, it means hidden or cryptic. Mm -hmm. And from that, I've gone on this journey of learning the hidden money methodologies that rich white families have used to create intergenerational wealth. So that's what prompted me to create the Crypto, financial, crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Movement which then you know, brought me to writing this book because this information is not really readily shared with our people. And because of that, um, generationally, we've been suffering, you know? And so, especially now with the recession and COVID, you know, people are really looking for ways to make money. You have all these flower organizations and these susus and these, everybody's talking about buying stocks and things of that nature, but we don't understand how money works. And that's the biggest part because we understand that part we wouldn't participate in these reindeer games that we've been yeah. fighting so hard to be a part of. So that directly segues into what I was going to say and ask next. So now with everything happening, there's like all of these get rich quick schemes and <laughs> black people are falling into the box and we're losing money because we don't know how to properly handle money. And so yeah. I did want you to speak a little bit more because I know like one of the first things you talk about in your book is about our unhealthy relationships and how we handle money. Um, I would love for you to just speak on like the history behind why we have these unhealthy relationships because outside of it just being a thing, it's historical. There's a reason, yeah. there's a root to why black people don't know how to properly handle money. And so if you could speak a little to that, that would be great. Okay. okay. So uh, first of all, I'll just, just tell you that uh, the name of the book is called a pot to piss in. And there's this saying that, you know, you're so poor that you don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. Now that evolves from uh, the days of the plantation, even prior to that, it was based on status. So back in the day, before we had running water and uh, pipes for toiletry, uh, when you wanted to relieve yourself, you had a pot in your home and you would relieve yourself and you take it and throw it out the window or take it out the door of the backyard. Um, so there became this moniker that if you had a bowl in your home that you had status, you know, mm. number one, we didn't really have our own homes because we were living in huts you know, on plantations and we didn't have a pot to, to relieve ourselves in. So status was based upon 
if you had a pot to piss in, you were at least some sort of status of some humane level of status. Uh, most of us didn't have that pot to piss in. So that's where the, the whole moniker of you, you're poor, you're, you're nothing, you're, you're less than because you don't even do, you don't even have this simple thing. Okay. So that starts the, the, the etymology of that whole mind frame of how we have been taught. We never had a relationship with money. And I'll even jump up further to 1865. Uh, when good old Abe, honest Abe, allegedly wanted to give us 40 acres and a mule and um, th part of the package, you know, of the emancipation. But of course, he was assassinated. And when President Andrew uh, Johnson took over, the first thing he did was he nullified that bill mm -hmm. and he instead gave us a bank. The bank he gave us was called Freedmen's, of all names, Freedmen's Bank. And Freedman's Bank was based in, uh, it started in New York City. It eventually moved down to, uh, to D.C. And it was for nine years that it, it, it stayed in business. This was the only bank that emancipated Africans, because we weren't slaves. Emancipated Africans were, could put their, send their money and put their money into, you know, to, to, to save, right? So no matter where you live, you had to send your money to this bank, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we learned is that, Freeman's bank was ran by not black people, but ran by white people. And these very same white people had the audacity to not give us loans for the very money that we put in the banks. So this is where the relationship I can bring it to 2020 Dang. is that we don't understand that the banks are nothing without our deposits. So we have it flipped around the other way. We think that we need banks and, and we can't do anything without banks. And to a degree, that's that's true because the whole banking uh, economic system, if it was to fail, you know, everything else would crash. Mm -hmm. But we have been seduced to believe that our money is safest in banks, opposed to what our maybe grandparents or great grandparents used to do, which is they would keep mm -hmm. it under the mattress or in, in their the pillow yep. or in the backyard, right? So there was a reason why they did that because they didn't trust banks, and that was because they had a history where when people wanted their money, when they had recessions. Uh, when they had the depression, mm -hmm. banks actually froze accounts. So that goes to show you that when you put your money into a bank, it really isn't your money anymore. And your money. Anymore. On top of the fact that there's a certain kind of relationship that happens, there's, a, there's an exchange that happens that we're not part of. So let me just bring up this piece that, again, as I mentioned, banks are not, they're nothing without us. And even they'll say it in there, uh, there's a Wells Fargo report that came out in 2004 that said that banks aren't necessary, but uh, banking is. So if people knew how important uh, learning about finances were, they wouldn't even use banks. But we've been seduced to use banks. If you think about it, what are the highest commercials you see on TV? If it's not an automobile, it's a bank commercial. They're always telling you, put your money in our banks. So this is what happens when you put your money in the bank. If you have no. for payday, you get paid $1,000, for instance. You get paid every two weeks, $1,000, whatever you get paid in your paycheck. Um, prior to direct deposit, uh, the banks had to wait for you to bring in your check, right? So in 19, uh, was it 1990? No, 2000, I can't remember the year, two, just after 2000, they began the direct deposit. Direct deposit now assures that the bank doesn't have to wait for you to walk into their doors and drop off your, your check. Right. They're going to get an influx of checks from corporations every whatever day they get paid and, and you know, uh, uh, occupations they pay on different days. Some pay on Monday, every, every two Mondays, every, every Wednesday, you know, every month, whatever. So the banks are always getting in money. So this is what happens when you make a deposit into the bank. If you put in even $100, the bank automatically 10Xs that deposit. So that $100 turns into $1,000 for the bank. And this is called the fractional lending system. So the fractional lending system, which is mandated by the U.S. government, allows the banks to 10x all your deposits. So if you put in 100, they get 1,000, turn into 1,000. All they got to keep on their books is that 100. They have now free new $100 or $900 that came out of nowhere, right? Now they have $900 that they can now lend out to any and everyone they want to, whoever they choose. And when they create a loan, when you create a loan, you create a relationship. So if you take out a loan, you know you got to pay them for a certain amount of time until you pay it off. Right. Well, in that loan relationship, the only person that gets paid back is the bank, not us who seeded the money for the bank to be able to make the, uh, the, the loan in the first place. But this is legal, and this is how the system works, is they take every deposit that every dollar you put in, even if it's 10 cents, 10,000, whatever it is, each deposit is 10x. 
and they take that profit, keep the minimum on the books, take the profit, and, and lend it out to developers who've come into our communities in the form of gentrification. Right. Uh, they, they, you know, they'll, and they are scrutinized who they want to give it to because just like with Freedman's Bank, they don't have to give us these loans. And when they do, people of color, people of African descent in the United States uh, get charged the highest interest rates, the highest service fees, right. and we have the most denials. Red so, you know, is that a part of redlining too? That's okay. absolutely a part of redlining. Absolutely part. The banking system has never been a friend to us. And so it's not to say, cut up your card, close your account. Oh, I am. Because you... <laughs> well, forget about it. Well, well done, not yet. Closed. So this is what I'm saying, not yet, because this, this what this is, is a game. It's a game. Okay. And if you understand the game, then you can flip it and use it against them. You can create leverage because all they practice is arbitrage. They understand they do something with money and create wealth with it that they won't let you know about. Right. But if we know about the game of arbitrage, which is what I put in this book, we t I show you methods that you can use to create this wealth using other people's money. And then when you get to a point where you've got enough that you need, you can just do away with all of that. You can cut your accounts, you can cut your credit, and you'll have your own uh, banking system, so to speak. Right. But again, yeah, the natural thing is, well, let me, let me cut them off. <laughs> but we still need them. If you think about it, your, 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 your electric company is going to take it from your checking account. Your credit card bill is linked to your, to your checking account. So you really can't cut it off just yet. But what we can do is learn out how it works and then learn how we can use it against them. And it's not illegal to do it. It's just that very few people are doing it. Only the rich people have been doing it. Right. And so when we start on it, and you mentioned about the, 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 the scams out there. The, yeah, the, yeah. So I, I hate, I got to be real with y'all, right? I got to take the gloves off with our people. Whenever black people come to you with these opportunities, it's usually a fourth quarter opportunity, meaning mm. three quarters have already passed. Mm. The money's been already made. It's probably down to two minutes left in the game of an opportunity, meaning there's just been so much of a window that you can get involved with yeah. because we are not party or we are not invited to these opportunities when they begin. We are brought in at the tail end because one, we're desperate. Number two, we're ignorant. We don't understand the game. And three, we're looking for a quick come up. We're not looking for slow money. We're looking for quick money. Right. And people in search of quick money are suckers. Unfortunately, that's what is happening. As people will jump into getting something, oh, I turned a thousand dollars into fifteen thousand uh, in in two months. Mm -hmm. How real is that? And if you did do that, can you liquidate it? Most people can't. They they can't tell you how to do that. Most people say, well, I invested in stocks and I got all this the stock portfolio, but do you watch the market? Do you see how your money has been dipping and, you know, and, and, you know, going into bear markets and are you <laughs> able to pull it out before it hits even more? So the other thing I want to sure. get into, if you don't, did you have another question? Cause I, I kind of want to get into another piece of it. Um, what I, well, what I was going to say was you talked about like not doing away with the banks yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but is there like, so you talked about Freedman's Bank and how that was for black people, but it wasn't ran by black people and how they were still discriminatory against black people. So we yeah. do have some black banks that are out there. Would you say <laughs> that they are black banks, you know, because if we talk about banking with black, banking with black, and then are they really for us? Like, are they really FUBU for us by us? <laughs> So that's a very real question. Um, we just saw the merge of two uh, of the top black banks, um, one United, and I can't remember the other one. They just merged to become the first billion dollar bank uh, in, uh, for black people or black bank that has over a billion dollars in assets, right? Before that, there were only two banks that were above 500 million. Um, there's less than uh, 50 black banks total, and there's over 6,000. Okay. of the banks in this country. So there's only 50 of them, right? And most of them don't even have uh, more than 100 million. So naturally you think some affinity like, yeah, let's go to Carver, or let's go to One United and put our money in these banks. But they practice the same arbitrage. They take your money, they get the, you know, they get the, uh, the, the, the fractional lending system 10X on your deposits and they use the money to make profit. And this is the point I didn't mention also is that when they make that profit from that investment that they loan it out to someone for 10 or 20 years for a mortgage or 20 or 30 years, 
or uh, or they did a car loan for 72 months, that interest that's being paid back is only going to the bank. We're receiving zero percentage, not even a dime, not even a penny from the loan that we created in the first place. So the black banks are doing the very same things that the white banks are doing because that's the nature of banks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's really no way around it. Personally, I'm like, you know, I don't need to go ahead and, and I hate to say it because you do want to support black people and black businesses, but the banking system is colorless. And that's the problem is because we have a $1.4 trillion purchasing power and we're only 1% producers. So even in the banking system, they're like, they have a very, very small percentage of, of, of um, existence in that space. And so um, I don't really want to, I don't really want to finance a bank, even if you're black, to continue doing to me what all the other banks are doing. That's the unfortunate thing. Wow. Dang. Yeah. Well, you know. Well, that was that was a great point because I'm sure like a lot of people may have been thinking about that. I know that was something that I was like, go to a black bank, you know. So to to get that insight, it it definitely helps me make my decisions on what I want to do with my money. Um, well, well, let me let me just just say this if you don't mind. Um, is it's not about because I don't want to talk over anybody's head about financial literacy, because that's, first of all, that's almost like kryptonite for us. Okay. You know, we don't like to talk about money because when we talk about money. We don't want nobody to know how broke we are uh, or it's going to turn into a fight because your cousin owed you $15 from 10 years ago and he still ain't paid you back. <laughs> so there's no type of wealth building conversations. And I understand that it, we have been, it's almost, yeah, it's taboo to talk about money, but it's a reason because of that, you know, we're not educated on it. And the other thing is we don't realize that everything we do is about money. So why aren't we talking about it, right? I have this question I ask people, what's the, what's the funniest thing or craziest thing you'd ever did for money? You know, and I basically say, you know, the craziest thing I ever did for money is I took out a loan to go to college so I could graduate and get a job to pay off my loans. Like, who does that? You know what I mean? Like, you go into college thinking you're going to get certified and then this job is going to be there for you. But the reality is, that if we can see not only the pandemic can eliminate 40 million jobs, but also artificial intelligence is on the move. We got to look yes. at Jeff Bezos and we got to look at Elon uh, Musk and uh, Husk and what he's doing in regards to creating artificial intelligence to have self-driving trucks, you know, to have uh, when you come into the Holland Tunnel and there's no one to take the $15 for you to come into the city no more. Everything is through easy pass that you're paying everything automated. Well, automation means the elimination of jobs. So if there are no jobs for us, then how can we earn a living? Right. And for those of us that have gone and played the WVB Du Bois route of getting educated over uh, Booker T. Washington, who talked about having a skill, right. for those of us that go that route and get certified, you come out with more debt than before you came in because these college universities are institutions of making money. And we found that out, it was confirmed with the threat of there not being a football, college football season. You suddenly heard about these towns like Columbus, Ohio, who have Ohio State Buckeyes, how they were actually, the city was gonna be probably, you know, and they were gonna probably lose a lot of money, they were gonna lose billions of dollars because of no football season. So we're understanding that these collegiate institutions are not about education. education yeah. Tuition has been out the roof ever since, it's been increasing every year since 2000 and it's beyond, you know, it's, it's more than what a job pays for. So we're living in a society where we're over certified and you come out of college and you're looking for a job and there's millions of graduates every year, but there's only a certain amount of million of jobs uh, created every year and people are getting laid off. So now we're competing against each other. You might have a job you've been at for 20 years. Well, tenure doesn't matter anymore because people want to hire younger, unfortunately dumber, or my, more naive and cheaper labor. So yeah. you're gonna, if you've been at that job, you're looking for that promotion, you might not ever get there because someone just graduated and I can pay, they're getting paid $40,000 less and you to know, do the Doug, same job you're doing. And Doug and I were just talking about that in the sense that you could, ha you could have been there 10 plus years and they'll, they'll pay you to train that person that they just brought and in and then lay you off and then make right. them manager or supervisor or head and Facts. you've been there so long, but because, like you said, they're naive and they don't have to pay them as much, they're going to fire you and hire them. We were just having that conversation. Yep. That, that's the reality of it. And, and so 
that's what they say is that if you don't design your life plan, someone else, chances are, chances are you're following someone else's plan. Mm. And what do they have designed for you? Not much. And that's the issue is because we're thinking that our employer, and this is what I learned, the real facts. When I lost my job, it hit me. Wow, my employer is not obligated to pay me for the rest of my life. Right. right. One day, each of us <laughs> will either get laid off, fired, or if lucky, you'll retire at your job. Right. But the Department of Labor Statistics shows that the average American today stays at their job 4.2 years. So if you started working in your 30s, you're going to have over 10 jobs by the time you retire. Okay. So how can you build wealth? How can you build not even wealth? How can you build sustainability having to jump in and get a new job every four or five years? You can't. Right. It's designed, it's designed to fail, and we're putting our money in these, uh, these monetary systems that are volatile, that we have no idea of how they work in our 401ks and our IRAs and the stock market. And we're hoping that it's going to be there when we're 65. But we need to have these discussions with these elders in our family and ask them, how's your money situation right now? And again, it's taboo. I'm on, yes. But if we, if we talk to our elders, they'll let you know, look, pensions are gone, okay? And 401k, if you look at 401ks, the last recession of 2000 seven to nine, the, uh, those in the senior citizen age bracket of 65 and over lost $2.7 trillion in their savings uh, that they retired on. Mm. So what did that, I personally lost 250,000. So I felt, I was like, you Ooh. know, but I was in my third, I was in my thirties. I'm like, okay, I guess I got it. This was a fluke. This isn't gonna happen again. So what did I start doing? I doubled down and I put more money into my IRA contribution because it was being matched by my job. Okay. But I, st I had to start all over. So this past uh, March, people lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in their retirement. Okay. Now the stock has still stayed steady, so it's grown some. But the point is, is that that's what happens throughout the duration of your relationship having stocks and 401ks is because you're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. So you can't predict how much money you're going to have when you need it most. You could be retiring and it'd be a recession right at that point. Or you could be retiring and there is an incline. You just don't know. And on top of that, out of all of those years that you've been making these contributions, you really haven't made a lot of money. But for those that are in control of this market, have made a killing. Because they know how to pull in and pull out, where to put the money, where to put it out or they don't even play that game. Right. That's the other part. That's a game for 99% of the people. The wealthy don't even play the stock market game. Warren Buffett doesn't play the stock market game. Ooh. So if we understood that and realized that, okay, I don't have Warren Buffett mo money, but I can get some of that Warren Buffett intelligence right. or the knowledge, I won't say intelligence, the knowledge, because it's just awareness. And then I'll know what I can do to apply to create myself to become sustainable because sustainability is what we should be reaching for not being rich it's about being okay. sustainable okay okay so i know i'm running you not <laughs> so you track me the, track me people a whole lot and listen <laughs> you got to buy the book you got to buy the book yeah it's all in the book this is great but like all the points and plus more in this book so again you segue into my next question this idea of wealth versus being rich people walk around with money and they're like i'm rich i'm rich but can you just touch on the wealth mindset versus just having money in your pockets yeah if you ask someone and and i, and I could ask everyone now and they, maybe they want to comment in the, in the in the chat here or whatever uh is um what is the number for you to be rich and people say oh a million dollars or 10 million dollars and that that's it's such a broad number because you think that's what rich is but you haven't factor in uh taxes you haven't factor in yeah. your expenses that you have which was what i call the financial endurance number or fen the financial endurance number are the number is the number that you need to take care of yourself every month so to me that number consists of all of your bills t-bills uh, even entertainment car notes insurances uh, you know, your mortgage or rent, that's a number. That every month is a round number that you have to pay every month. So for me, 
being sustainable, not being rich, being sustainable, meaning you can take care of yourself and maintain, right. your FEN number gives you that. Your FEN number is based upon all of those ex expenses for the month, and you multiply that by 12 okay. for 12 months. So if your expenses are $2,000 a month, including food bills and, and gas and entertainment and all that stuff, comes down to $2,000 a month, then for the year, you are spending $24,000 in expenses. That is your financial endurance number. You need to make that number to be able to live. So when you have that number, then a penny over, you're rich. So the goal is, is how, how do you attain that number? Most of us attain that FEN through a job. Yeah. Our boss pays us. Yeah. And that's what allows us to you know, pay for our bills and pay for our food and the lifestyle that we have. But here's the thing, as, as I just mentioned, is that no job is guaranteed. They can let you go whenever they want to. And the funny thing is we got to give them two weeks notice, right? It's professional courtesy. But they'll let you go at a moment's notice, right? When you're walking out on a Friday night, you had a good week. And they let, right. tell you, we let, they let you go, right? So the point is, is that uh, when we understand what our FEN number is, then we can start planning on how we're going to move forward to create intergenerational wealth. Intergenerational wealth comes after you can maintain the, the money that you bring in. So again, it's tied to your employer. So if your employer lets you go, your FEN number ain't going to be met, right? Right. You can't get $2,000 a month because you, you lost your job. So the goal is to find out what else can I do? And this is what Robert Kiyosaki talks about is the uh, creating your cash flow and passive income. So if your passive income, passive income is basically, uh, say for instance, you rent, uh, maybe you have an extra room in your home and you rent it out or Airbnb, right. or maybe you got a side business, maybe you make candles or something that you have consistently coming in. That is considered, um, that is considered passive income. So when you can get that passive income number to equal your FEN number, so you got $2,000 in expenses, if you can make $2,000 in passive income, you can fire your, you can fire your boss. You can leave your job because you're not dependent on the job to get you the money to create and keep your FEN. Right. So that's what it really comes down to is understanding the numbers. And these are the really hard conversations. And it's really, no, I'm sorry. It's not hard. It's a simple conversation, but we've never been told, or it's never been given to us this way. We've been told you need to get up, make a life for yourself, get a career, get a job, right? Yeah. Get a house. When you graduate, you better have a house and a car because that's what graduates do. How can you have a degree and you still you and you still walking? That's not successful. So we buy into the material illusion of what a successful person is, and we end up drowning in debt. Right. So much that we don't even want to look at our debt. We don't want to look at our credit score. We don't even want to because you know we're paying uh, tuition bills into our fifties because we want to pay the minimum on all of our loans and debts, <laughs> not realize that we can hit over the head and in interest, interest payments, yep. pay that thing off. But it's that very real conversation that um, I found, it wasn't told to me. And I assume with our people, it hasn't had a lot of, uh, uh, we haven't had a lot of that conversation as well. So that's why I wrote this book. Cause I'm like, look, and that's why I teach my course is because I want people to understand it's not your fault that you're in a financial situation you're in. And you're about to be enlightened in something that is very simple, but we were kept out because of our complexion. Right. But now we know in the information age, we can do something about it. And you can not only change your life, you can change your bloodlines life right. 70 years into the future. That part, yes. Um, I did see we had some people, and then I have one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, let me see. I'm over here being grandma again, trying to figure this out. <laughs> um, so Doug said, get good information. It is a calamity that an 18-year-old is programmed by society to make such a detrimental decision without knowing this information. Um, very true. And then I think it's Rosie. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. They said, hey, do you think it would be beneficial to have $25,000 in cash for backup versus having all in savings IRA saving and and money marking account uh it depends on where you had at 25 grand don't have it under your bed <laughs> under your mattress because one you're going to tap it or two if you lose it it's gone 
Um, so there are other, and I, I teach it in the book and in my class about where you can put your monies, how you can act. I closed my um, 401ks at the beginning of this year before the recession happened because I knew a recession was coming. Because, And that's the other thing I didn't mention is that recessions are planned. They're cyclical. So they happen every 10 to 12 years. And the latest has been every five to six years. But this last, we had about 10, 12 years uh, cushion. But in each of those recessions, you risk losing all of your retirement money each time. So you'll go five or six years building it back up and recession just tears it back down, builds it back up. And it's cool when you're in your 30s, but when you're in your 40s, your 50s, and now you're in your 60s and another recession comes, this is your retirement money, not to mention all the other years that you've lost money and had to rebuild it back up. Now you have less than seventy or $50,000 to live and the average person lives 20 years post-retirement. Dang. So you can't live off of fifty thousand or seventy thousand dollars for twenty years. You can't. So I would not put the. I, I can show you where you can put the money instead of having twenty five thousand dollars just sitting there. It is better not to put it in the bank because the bank only gives you barely one one percent savings. And when you put in twenty five thousand dollars, they turn that into uh, two hundred two point five million. Oh. Is it ten x twenty five thousand? Yeah, they two two hundred fifty thousand turns into twenty five thousand. I mean two hundred fifty thousand. From you depositing into their banks, so you just gave them, you know, a quarter of a million dollars, and they're giving you a service fee, right? right. They're giving overdraft you fee. Uh, overdraft. Yeah. Exactly. And this is the reward. Have, and, and with some banks, you got to have a certain amount of money in there because they yep. will charge you that fee if you take a certain amount out. Like. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So we, but we've been taught that we need banks. So, and to a degree, we do. But once we, we're going to use them, if you take my course or read the book, you'll learn how you can use them for just a little bit. That's just, I'll say maybe depending on your financial situation, no more than five years, six years, it could be as little as two years. And it's not a get rich quick thing. It's just understanding where to put your monies, where not to put the money, whose money to use and not your money. Because in most cases, we're using our money. We're using monies from our savings that we work for to pay for our bills. We don't realize that we can use other people's money legally free but we don't understand that relationship so if you're taught that then you understand how it can build wealth because our jobs are never going to pay you they pay you just enough for you to show up every monday they're never going to pay you enough to be wealthy if that was the case they would keep it for themselves which is what they're doing yeah um so and Bebe is giving y'all everything right now and i will <laughs> all of the nuggets and i will say this um he gives a plethora of strategies to building intergenerational wealth, black wealth, and just how we can make sure that our families are taken care of generations down the line. Not just us, not just today, but we're talking generations after we're gone, how our families can still sustain. And so what I will ask, because you have so many, I don't want you to give them everything, but could you just give your top three, your top three strategies to acquiring intergenerational wealth for you? Top three. Um, <laughs> pull your money out of the money markets. That's one. Um, so do like, you mean like stocks and 401k? Yes. IRA? Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't, don't play the stock game because Wall Street is like Vegas. The house always wins. <laughs> You're never going to profit in the stock market. And if you are going to play the stock market game, um, you have to be on that game. You have to be watching every day. And no one really wants to do that. No one really wants to. It's a stressful job. I've been, I used to work on Wall Street. And I was like, nah, I can't. I, there's, I can't see how I can do it. That's why most of them are young. Most of the brokers are young because they burn out very yeah. quickly. Very few old people are there. <laughs> um, but the other thing that I would say, the second second advice, I would say top thing, um, is to hmm, 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 take my course. <laughs> I mean, I got to plug it because Absolutely. there's things that, um, and it's not because, oh, he's trying to get paid. No, it's because I want to walk you through this situation because everyone's situation is unique, but they're all the same. And the number one thing is we haven't been taught financial literacy. There needs to be a historical, that's why I did the first part of the book, a historical breakdown of the, the relationship with money before I talked about wealth building tactics, because the history keeps you on point. Right. When you realize why am I doing this? Why has, 
you know, why is it that every generation has to start at zero instead of, you know, I never heard of authorized users and putting on my credit cards to help my children come at, you know, why do, why do Jewish people have bar mitzvahs, the kids 13 years old, and they have six figure money to that that's given to them is because they invested it in the right place and not in the stock market. So how can I take that information? And then if I have children, or not even if I have children, my siblings, my family, how can I come bring us all up in a position just by utilizing arbitrage stack tactics that banks uh, and lenders use doing the same thing and it's all legal and enabling us to create intergenerational wealth. And the third thing I would say that the third tactic I would say is to um, really be not be afraid to rid yourself of all traditional practices. If you want to be financially literate, especially through the crypto, crypto world financial sustainability movement, we're going to have a lobotomy. We're going to take a, we're going to do a financial lobotomy of your brain and change everything that you've yeah. been taught about money and flip it on you. And it was done to me. And as I learned, because, uh, again, the way I see money now, it is a tool. It is a form of currency energy, but at the same time, if you use it correctly, it could be magnetized. And not only just help you, but help your family. And not only helping your family, but hell, we can look at our community. Right. Instead of buying a home, how about we buy a block? And more importantly than that, finances freeze your time. When you free your time, yeah. then you can really do the things that you were put on this earth to do. Why was I born? What is my purpose? I was not born to work Everything. for Ford for 25 years and yeah. then I'm done. Yes. You know, we have some, some geniuses out here. We have a genius gene that gets stifled because we got to clock in yep. you know, every day and take the most precious day time of our lives during the day. So if, I, if we can financially free ourselves and our financial endurance number is taking care of that small number, not that rich number of a million dollars, but how about $24,000 for a person that makes $2,000 and has $2,000 in expenses a month? If I can help you learn how to save $24,000 and create it on your own, you are free. Right. You are free, and now you can live the life you want to live. Woo. So Listen, y'all need this book. So what I'm seeing is that people are saying that they um they want to know where to purchase the book. I'm also going to type it here, but can you just tell people where to purchase the book? Yes, you can go to CryptoWokeMovement.com. That's C-R-Y-P-T-O, CryptoWokeMovement.com. And I'm and just typing it there in the comments. And it's available in yeah, paperback, uh, ebook, digital PDF. And I am currently recording the audiobook version, which will be done before uh, Thanksgiving. Dang, I'm so hyped. Um, and, I, and I haven't even it. finished the book, but like, I'm excited. Um, and before we end, I will say I purchased two copies of Mbwebe's book because. I want to support my brother and I want to support a black author. So what I'm doing is I'm keeping a copy for myself, but I'm also gifting a book to someone that is interested. So if you commented below and you were like, I want to purchase the book, still purchase the book. Please still purchase the book yes, and support, <laughs> support our black authors. But I am also gifting a copy to anyone that is interested this is the type of information that we need to be talking about in our homes, with our families, and with our children. It is so important. Um, we talk about group economics and building with each other. This is where we start. And so do you have any last comments, uh, plugs, shares that you would like to give to the people before we end our conversation? Yes. Um... Number one, thank you, sis. I appreciate you. Um, and uh -huh. the love is always there. And I, I appreciate you doing this for me. And, you know, anything I could do to, to reciprocate, that's, what, that's how we do as fam. Um, second of all, thanking all the listeners, those that are alive, those that will thank listen you. in the future. I'm hoping that uh, we are all on this quest. And, you know, more times than now because of the pandemic and because of the recession and because of that Cheeto dude in the office, uh, <laughs> that we have to, we have to make some serious decisions. Uh, again, uh, your job is not safe. Artificial intelligence is very real. Those jobs are being automated. So yep. you tenure, tenure is out the window. 
So we, if we don't do anything about this right now and we start losing these jobs, this $1.4 trillion spending power we have will be decimated to net zero by the year 2030, the next 10 years. So if we don't have a spending power, then we really don't have anything, a, a voice in what goes on in this country. So we really have to take this thing seriously about being financially literate. If it's with me or anybody else, do your diligence, learn about finances, learn about where you can put that, uh, your finances to build that wealth. And I would be happy to help you. Um, crypto woke movement, um, CryptoWokeMovement.com is the website you can visit. Uh, CryptoWoke is the uh, moniker for Facebook and also IG. Um, and I'm here to you know, help in any way possible to get us all financially literate so we can have a say in the future um, for our generations to come. So give thanks. Um, so thank you, of course. Can you just drop your, um, your social media handle so people know where to find and follow you? Because I see um, Joe asked about more information on the course. And again, yes. because I want to respect your time, I definitely um, would love for you to connect with the listeners, but where can they find you to do so? Yes, um, you can reach me at Crypto Woke. So Facebook is, is at Crypto Woke, IG is at Crypto Woke. Uh, if you go to CryptoWokeMovement.com, um, you can even find me on YouTube. I've actually do some, uh, I do some lessons on, uh, on YouTube. So you can check out, just look up Crypto Woke on YouTube, and um, it's a long address. So just go ahead and just, just, just put in the search for Crypto Woke, and you'll see my lessons there. And that's where you will find the book of Pop the Pits in, and also the course that I have. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's time to get financially lit. You know, that's what it's really all about, because everybody else is prepared except us. Yep. So, you know, that's why I think it's important that we get on. It's, it's about time for this. So, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, brother, for being here. Yeah. And I wish you much, much success on your journey. And um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. If you are interested in the book, go ahead and slide in my messages and let me know that you're interested. And I will send this to you first thing tomorrow, a pot to piss in, in a generational wealth planning for Black people. And that concludes our session. And Bebe, I'll see you soon. And yes, everyone absolutely. else, have a great night. All right. like what you heard today, be sure to hit that like button. And to learn more, go to CryptoWokeMovement.com. That's CryptoWokeMovement.com. So you might ask the question, what is CryptoWoke? Well, in the word, you might hear the word crypto. But I want to be clear, the CryptoWoke Financial Sustainability Movement is not about cryptocurrency. What we're talking about, when you look at the etymology of the word crypto, you find the word cryptic. And cryptic actually means hidden. So what we're talking about is using cryptic or hidden money methods used by wealthy families over 200 years that has enabled them to continue to make intergenerational wealth. My mission is broken into two phases. Phase one consists of getting 300 people financially literate on the path to sustainability. And phase two is to move those 300 people towards physical and virtual cooperative communities, creating intergenerational, economic, ecological and cultural resuscitation and preservation by way of joint endeavors. Now, what does that mean? That basically means if I can get my money situation right and you have your money situation right, instead of buying a home, we can buy a block. Instead of starting a small local business, we can create an enterprise on a global level. I will be posting more videos on financial literacy. So if you like this type of information, be sure to subscribe. And if you like today's video, hit that like button. And also be sure to hit that bell so you'll be notified when I post new videos up. So join the movement, the Crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Movement, where you can live the life of your choosing, living off your savings and investments. Change not only your future, but your bloodline.